Welcome to Corpse Club, the official podcast of DailyDead.com. I'm one of your co-hosts, Jonathan James, and today I am joined by Brian Kiss- Christopher. I'm going to redo it because I called you Christopher. No, I think you, from now on, I think I should be Brian <laughs> that, Christopher. Yes, that is awesome. <laughs> Brian Christopher. Oh my gosh. There it is. That's it. Like the new Kiss lineup. <laughs> 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 new Halloween name. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll just be I'll just be dressed up like Gene Simmons for the rest of the month. <laughs> oh well, my god. You have the star around your eye now. <laughs> I wasn't gonna say anything, but it's very it all makes sense now. Now you know. And Derek Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> Best intro ever. We're leaving it. And uh, in this podcast, you, you, you know what you get from us. Um, you, you always get 200%, but, uh, but some days you get Soup Fest, some days you get Brian Kistifer, and, uh, and today you are going to be getting us talking about Smile, us talking about Hocus Pocus 2, uh, New Hellraiser, Midnight Club, and much, 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 much more. Um, ahead of time, I will say that I think as is the case for a number of episodes that we do these days. My co-host and I have not seen any of the other things that the other co-host has seen. So if you're like, hey, like, I don't want to hear about the new Hellraiser movie. I haven't seen it yet. We will be keeping this as spoiler-free as humanly possible. Obviously, if you know nothing about the movie, you'll learn a little something about the movie. We can't help that, but nothing that you haven't seen in trailers. And uh, and I can see Brian's already like, uh oh, he said Hellraiser. He's gonna I'm say getting, something. I'm about getting itchy. It. I'm getting itchy. <laughs> and at some point, I will let Brian know when when he can eject from the conversation, so he hears nothing about Hellraiser. You can do the same, but please do come back. We need you, listeners, and Brian. Um, we need we need you too. <laughs> <laughs> Where would you be without Brian Kissinger? <laughs> So, uh, with that said, we're going to start with Smile. Um, Heather had a chance to see it before Fantastic Fest. We saw a lot of people who saw it at Fantastic Fest. Feedback's been great. It's box office success. I'm excited to see it. But Derek, you, like, you literally just saw it. I saw like your, like your your soda or pop or soda pop, whatever you call it, cup in hand because you just got back from the theater. Yes, I've got my, it's actually still relatively cold. It's Caddyshack Peace Tea. So that is uh, delicious. That's usually my go-to at the movies. And I would have a box of Junior Mints, but I finished those off long ago. So that is not with me right now. But well, I do find I, it interesting that you come home <laughs> with soda or drink still left because it. I get maybe a third of the way through the movie at best with whatever snacks and drinks that I have. This yeah, is going to be... Oh, I was gonna say this is gonna be in the oversharing piece, but like if I have like, like even like a tenth of that large cup that you have there, like I'm gonna have to run to the restroom. So like I don't drink a lot of liquid because I will not make it through the movie. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. You know, it's funny because I used to get really worried about that too, and now it's like, I think I I kind of strategize how much water or coffee or whatever I have before I go to the theater, and then. So I feel like I'm I've almost like parched myself a little bit. But today I actually was having some like coffee in the afternoon. So I was and and I got to the theater late, like during the trailers. So I didn't even have time to go to the bathroom before the movie. So I was really that for me, that's like, you know, plus it was Irish coffee. So he was very drunk. <laughs> yeah, this this sounds this this is on brand for Derek. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten spoiled too because being at home and just watching movies like if i want to take a bathroom break i'm just like just pause (laughs) and i'll know too like if i have my my parents over i'll pause during the act breaks i'll be like this is a good point to stop does anyone need anything does anyone have to go to the restroom so like honestly like we're good like seeing movies in 30 minute chunks at this point um i might when i go back to regular theater i may not make it i did see barbarian and i survived but I didn't have water with me. Anyway, we're talking about Smile. That's what we're doing here. Um, what do you think, Derek? Uh, not to be. Yeah, I, well, I wouldn't say I was uh, smiling after watching it, but that that's not because of the quality of the movie. It was just not a feel good movie. Obviously, um, if you're familiar with the plot of the film, it's basically uh, like a therapist. One of her patients 
um like uh basically what happens is if you see someone die in front of you uh in kind of a gruesome way it's almost like this curse passes on to you and you only have so you start to see things um really like gruesome imagery and it's only a matter of time it's kind of like the ring where you only have a certain amount of time before you're the next one to die in a horrible fashion so it's a very like grim story and and definitely um you know deals with a lot of aspects of of mental health and and uh just things that are you know very very can can be very grim in some ways but uh the story itself though is so well executed um i had a lot of hype going into this one but it definitely lived up to pretty much all of the hype that i had i think the only thing i would say that maybe was a drawback is that it actually could have probably been shorter i think it almost runs to about a little under two hours I think this could have been like an hour and a half and it would have been a little bit tighter and, you know, they still could have done what they wanted to do, but super impressed, especially because the writer and director, Parker Finn, this is his like feature length film debut based on his short film, Laura Hasn't Slept. And he like, I, I would never guess that this is his first movie. It's so well made. Uh, the scare, the jump scares are really well executed. It's got that James Wan conjuring type pacing with the jump scares where they like are, sometimes they subvert your expectations. Sometimes it's exactly what you expect, but it's like it's never it's never boring. It's always intense. And uh, and Sosie Bacon and uh, Kyle Gallner are really, really good in it as well. So I would say definitely uh, something I would recommend. But be warned going into it it's it gets pretty intense and uh and dark at times i am definitely looking forward to checking it out hopefully over the next couple of weeks i will see it i really enjoyed the marketing campaign um you had all those they got people just standing out there with their creepy smiles at baseball games <laughs> at other kind of events and apparently they didn't ask for permission for it so it was just like you know pretty pretty low cost marketing and uh and very effective and um i don't know I'm a, I'm a sucker for those curses seven days to solve it type deal um it uh yeah it definitely uh it definitely seems like it came out at the right time and it's cool we get you know all these we get original horror movies people are getting excited about um yeah it's it's a good time to be a horror fan yeah, I'm just hooked by the just that two second clip that you see in a lot of the trailers where you see the woman coming up to the like beside the car in the sweater and then just like oh, yeah. the head pendulums down like that freaks me out every time I see it. So I yeah. anything that can do that with a trailer or like a TV spot, I'm intrigued. Yeah. And even even watching that scene in the theater uh, was super like knowing what was going to happen. It still freaked me out just because I wanted to see how that tied into like the overall story and how they executed it. And it did not disappoint. I, I there's only, a, I saw it kind of in the afternoon. There's only two other people in the theater with me, but that's almost scarier in a way when you're almost in empty theater. Uh, but it was, yeah, the, the scares really all landed and, uh, they, worked with uh, Amalgamated dy Dynamics, um, Tom Woodruff Jr. and Alec Gillis. Yeah, did a lot of ABI. practical effects for the film. And there's some really gnarly, uh, nightmarish creature design in this that is really, really cool. Uh, I would say overall the vibe of the movie too, it's a lot more Nightmare on Elm Street and it follows than I expected. Like very interesting how they weave in the mythology and kind of do their own thing while also still being very reminiscent of those properties and in a good way though where it's more like it's still very much its own original creation but you're getting those like kind of waking nightmare vibes and they went a lot harder than i expected like this is a hard hard r and it's like really disturbing to watch at times like i was almost reminded of the sadness a little bit not that it goes quite that far but i was like for a major theatrical release i am very i'm kind of i'm you know a little uh surprised at some of the stuff that they left in but i think it all kind of benefits the story as well and they just didn't really want to pull any punches i don't think with it so i'm glad that uh that they did what they did but it's yeah it's a it's an experience <laughs> it's interesting because we're seeing you know there was i don't know 
early 2000s or mid 2000s, early 2010s, the, uh, the, the plan for studios was to make a movie that might be R, but you could also like flex down to PG-13. Prometheus did that, a number of others. We could just be like, you saw where they're like, we're going to pull back just in case we need to move this around because they weren't very confident in our rated uh, sci-fi or horror. And now, you know, we're seeing some studios that are like, yeah, go for it. Um, it makes for a better, I feel like it, it always makes for a better story when a director isn't restrained. So if they have a PG-13 movie in mind, cool, that's fine. But if they have an R-rated movie in mind, just let them do it at that point, you know? <laughs> um, that, that middle ground always, it always kind of shows. Um, so yeah, that's cool. And um, yeah, I'm excited and to check it out soon. And I know we've we've talked about you know with the creepy smiles and the marketing and the trailer, and it's reminiscent of Blumhouse's Truth or Dare. Uh, but I will say the smiles in this one are not; they don't seem to be like CG enhanced. They all seem to be like whatever the actor can do. So it actually, I was expecting them to go like really almost like a like a Snapchat Comical. filter level, yeah. you know, with it. But it's actually a little more restrained in that department, which act makes it a little more creepy because it's kind of like you know just that version of that actor without really going too over the top with it. Even I'm trying to do it on camera now, but my <laughs> smile just isn't, I, mean, I don't have a smile smile. Derek, you might. No, Derek's got it. Look at, he's got it. I know, I know our listeners can't, uh, you can't see Ooh, it, but I got scared. Yeah. Trust me, Derek, Derek's, Derek's got it. He turned his head down. He's got, I don't have it. My, my lips don't move. Don't move that much to the side. Anyway, um, where are we now? We're, we're back. We're, we're to Brian, Brian. Um, we didn't we didn't call it out, but I I'm excited. I know you got um, exposed to some uh, more international horror. I know you've been expanding your horizons and specifically yes. uh, Indian horror films, which you know I, I like to be able to um, turn our listeners and our daily dead readers on to things that may not be on their radar. So what did you check out? Absolutely. So this came from. Um, as I've been making, you know, uh, some new friends in the Seattle area, uh, one of them, uh, Rohit, uh, he's originally from India. Uh, we have been connecting on a lot of our movie tastes. Uh, I think it actually kind of kicked off with our shared love of Jean-Claude Van Damme movies. Uh, so it's, it's evolved from there in terms of like, there's a lot of things we really like, uh, that we have in common. Um, but I don't really have a lot of background or experience with Bollywood movies. Um, and so, uh, Rohit kind of said like, you know, there's some, some pretty good Bollywood horror stuff out there. Um, he did preface that with, you don't usually get a lot of like straightforward horror. Uh, it's usually mixed with other elements, um, uh, usually like psychological thrillers. Um, you know, they also like to incorporate like, you know, when they can song and dance numbers, things like that. Um, but he actually uh, had a couple of movies that were pretty straightforward, even though one was more of a horror comedy. Uh, the first one that he we kind of did a double feature evening. And the, the first one we watched was called Go, Go, A Gone which he described as kind of being like a spiritual successor to like Shaun of the Dead. Uh, it's a zombie movie that takes place in like the the tourist town of Goa uh, in India. And it's these three friends. Uh, two of them are kind of stoners. One's like kind of the everyman stoner. He's kind of your your lead. Um, and then another one is like the the more classic, like bad influence stoner. Uh, he's kind of like the the Nick Frost character. Uh, and then they introduce kind of a third element, which is uh, a, a character named Bunny, who's a little bit more of like a square and a little bit more kind of like just neurotic. And he's a little bit of the foil for the group. Uh, so they go to... Like they get uh, this invitation to this party that is said to be run by uh, the Russian mafia. And so like there's all kinds of, you know, 
uh, illicit materials being passed around, drugs, things like that. And there's this very special pill that gets handed out uh, that winds up turning people into zombies. Uh, and it turns into like this tropical island turned zombie infestation uh, movie. Uh, it's really good. Um, it's funny. Uh, it's got some like legitimate, like fun gore gags in it. Um, you know, I, I think Rohit was right when he said that it's very close to, you know, um, uh, Shaun of the Dead in terms of like tone and tempo. Uh, so I really enjoyed this. Um, um, yeah, I don't want to give too much away about it because I think it's something that that people should definitely see. Um, but uh, it was it was really funny, um, and I think it's kind of like a really good uh, entry point if you're looking for like a good gateway horror movie into Indian Indian horror. Yeah, that's great. I mean, um, you know, I, I often say we're getting a lot of new horror movies now. There's a new release pretty much every week. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes people are like, hey, like I've seen everything. Like, like when are they going to make good horror movies? And I'm like, there are so many good horror movies that you haven't seen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, and I know this doesn't apply to everybody. But, you know, there's a lot of people that will zone in on specific decades, keep them, you know, more around U.S. and U.K., but expand your horizons. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, Indian cinema, whether it's uh, Korean, um, you know, Japanese, wh whatever the case may be, um, there are uh, filmmakers who are now, you know, um, creating excellent genre uh, movies. And there are decades of movies that you could catch up on. So um, I always like to, to get new recommendations because I know I have plenty of blind spots. We all do. And this one's been around for a bit. It's back. Uh, it was made back in 2013. Um, so, um, you know, it should be, you know, fairly, fairly readily available. I think we wound up watching it like, uh, he had purchased it on YouTube or something like that. Uh, so it shouldn't be hard to find. Um, and then the, the second part of that double feature that we did, uh, was a little bit more, uh, leaned harder into the horror. It's called, uh, boot, uh, B H O O T, uh, by a filmmaker named, uh, Ram Gopal Varma, uh, who, uh, my friend kind of described as someone who has just gotten like, crazier and crazier as his career has gone on uh this is um pretty well known or not uh in um it was when it came out it was perceived as different and this is just from the wikipedia page because it was a, a hindi film that didn't contain like songs or, or dance numbers so it's a very kind of straightforward going for like a moody ghost story uh because it's about this couple that moves into a high rise they get like a really good deal on it of course the reason they got a really good deal on it was because the last person who lived there committed suicide um and so things start getting wonky you know the you the the uh, uh, the woman starts seeing things in the house, starts seeing things in the mirror, uh, eventually starts getting possessed. You know, it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that it's the the spirit of the the woman who had committed suicide there. Um, and the the mystery comes down to you know why did this person commit suicide? Uh, you get the sense that it's um, it's kind of similar to Stir of Echoes, where like this ghost seems to be nudging her in a certain direction. Um, I really liked the way it resolved. Um, I will say it was not as effective for me overall as Go, Go, Agon. Uh, this was another one, you know, Derek, you mentioned that uh, Smile could have been shorter. Uh, this definitely could have been shorter. It was 109 minutes, and there were too many scenes where, like, just lingering on a character was traded in for the, an idea of tension. So like, you know, you get the sense that he was trying to, like, draw out certain scenes to kind of, like, get out the creep factor but it actually just kind of wound up being like okay we get it let's let's move on uh so this one was more i think effective in certain areas than as a whole um but it's definitely still one that i would recommend checking out because the 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 points at which it it did kind of hit the good notes it, it definitely uh hit them well um i will say the 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 friend that introduced me to it said he was wondering if it was going to hold up for him it absolutely did not um but i definitely did see some uh um you know some rays of of, of good stuff kind of shining through there even though it wasn't wholly effective for me nice yeah that sounds really interesting i love and i, I enjoy stir of echoes a lot too so it I, it sounds like more of a slow burn supernatural experience versus a more fast-paced zombie experience in the mm -hmm. other films so but i definitely like this is totally a department where i need to like ex like i need to expand my viewing list and 
bring in more international films. And I just love like getting those different perspectives, even if it's like a very similar like plot to something that I've seen. Like I love seeing it. Well, what, what would, how would it be like in that country or like what would happen differently or what are they, what's going on there that would impact the story. So I really want to like incorporate more of that, especially like this time of year with Halloween marathons and just watching so many scary movies. Like it's so nice to like incorporate that and just get some different perspectives and, and kind of, you know, get off what you might be used to watching. So I'm definitely gonna have to incorporate uh, those into my viewing lists in the next couple of months. And it did very much help to watch it with someone who was from like those parts of India to give that cultural context of why some of that stuff mattered. Uh, Cause it was definitely stuff that would have gone right over my head, uh, both in terms of the humor from go, go, Agon, And then in terms of kind of the, the, the more disturbing elements and some of the things that could have gotten under your skin more, I might've missed had I not watched it with someone who could have given me that cultural context. So that was a, a good way to be able to see them. Yeah, that's great. And uh, and hopefully more. I, I don't uh, I don't know if you have plans yet, but uh, but we will we will check back in. Now, yes, now nothing, nothing set in stone yet, but yeah, absolutely. Yes. We're going to get back to it. Cool, cool. If you are listening to this episode on October the 7th, it is the premiere date for The Midnight Club. Uh, I had a chance to check out all 10 episodes. I am going to give some very brief details on my my impressions and what you can expect um it is based on uh the work of christopher pike and um anybody who grew up in the in the 90s and you know there's there's your rl stein there's your your stephen king there's your dean Koontz, there's your christopher pike uh, and so we probably all have very fond memories of, of those authors and others um but it is cool to uh to see uh like i said to see this being adapted and uh, expanded upon. And um, so for those that aren't familiar, the, the Midnight Club is the, there is this hospice that is set up just for um, teens that are termini- terminally ill. There's only a handful of, of kids here because it's, it's not a very large location. Um, it is run by this uh, doctor played by Heather Langenkamp and we're introduced to, to these teens and we learn more about their personal lives, their ailments and their interactions with each other. Um, and then one of the things that really kind of ties them all together is at midnight, they will get together um, when, uh, nobody, uh, nobody knows they're around, they'll sneak out of their rooms. They will meet, um, in front of a fireplace and, and sit at the table and tell each other scary stories. And, um, it's really cool because this show, the series kind of takes an episodic approach with each of the stories. So we'll see what is like the main story following these characters and their lives at the hospice and maybe some mysteries that they uncover. But then each episode has a story that the Midnight Club is telling. And then we learn more about them through these stories. Um, And we do see, you know, different actors kind of jump in. Some of the the, um, actors that that, that will play the teens, they will swap out and kind of play different roles within these stories. Um, but it's, it's definitely like, you know, uh, like, are, like, are you afraid of the dark? And so I think, you know, my expectation for people going in, because this does carry a TV MA and it earns it um, because of the subject matter. But I don't, wouldn't, wouldn't say, I would say for people that are expecting something like Gerald's game or, hush or midnight mass that for me this is very much like mike flanagan's take on um like i said like on are you afraid of the dark so i do think that even though they deal with heavy topics and they deal with mature topics and you can enjoy this no matter what age you are i do feel like maybe the primary audience for this um, as opposed to some of the others may be more like late teens young adults um, and of course, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I definitely say, you know, um, if you're, you're not familiar with this, check it out. If you're a fan of, of Mike Flanagan's work, check it out. Um, and then, you know, I think another thing that I, I 
I'll call out before I let my co-host comment is that there are some fantastic performances here. Um, Amon Benson, uh, she, you know, really is the, um, she's really the main character, but she is supported by so many other actors, including Ruth Codd. Um, this is uh, her first role and she's fantastic. She's, you know, kind of really the breakout star. So I'm excited for people to see um, Ruth's performance. Um, she's also going to be in Fall of the House of Usher from Mike Flanagan coming up. And she kills it in this uh, series. So, uh, so yeah, good stuff all around. I feel like Netflix is becoming the house that Mike Flanagan built. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I know, you know, there's definitely like the bigger stuff like Stranger Things or something like that. But he just seems to keep pumping out really reliable stuff. Um, not just reliable, but just really good. Um, I am intrigued by the idea of something a little bit more episodic, something that doesn't like almost require like a binge watch, you know, like you don't go into midnight mass going like, Oh, I'm going to dabble here and there. It's like, no, no this is like, I this have is to gonna, know. Yeah. yeah this is yeah. going to be done in you know, like a couple days. Uh, it sounds like this is something though, that you can kind of like make a little bit more of a, an extended meal out of by like dabbling here and there and not necessarily feeling like, you know, you have that like push to, to kind of keep the narrative going. Yeah, I could have, I did this in three days, but I could have done it as a weekly series because those individual stories that they tell at the, at the meeting of the midnight club is enough to like, keep your interest. In some cases you forget that there's this like larger story or other world because some of those individual segments are so strong on their own. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm really sold on this. I mean, I was already totally on board just being a fan of Christopher Pike and finally seeing him get the credit he deserves, because I think for so many years he was in the shadow of, you know, R.L. Stein and Stephen King. And of, of course, I also love those authors, but I feel like knowing that Mike Flanagan has been a fan of his work for so many years, like he was and hearing that he was going to do this series, it just seemed like the perfect marriage. So I'm really excited that they actually were able to make this happen and to have Christopher Pike as one of the executive producers and to find a way to like use one of Pike's stories, uh, the midnight club to then have kind of be like an anthology framework where you can then tell other of his stories and find kind of a natural way to adapt more of his material in a way that might get more people to discover his work or just find a way to actually do it without maybe not necessarily making a feature length movie based on each of those books. I think that's such a brilliant idea and a great framework. And then I'm just, yeah, I'm excited. I, I, I mean, just from what Flanagan's been doing, I mean, midnight mass, I'm still recovering from, you know, the emotional <laughs> devastation <laughs> and addictiveness of watching that series. I think, that's really going to stick with me for a long time. Uh, but it's it's so cool that he was able to make this happen. And and really, um, hopefully people will go and read a lot of Pike's stuff, because even a lot of his stuff that was written for teenagers still holds up now because he pushed boundaries so much and told stories that a lot of people might not have told if he hadn't done it for younger readers. So it's really cool that that Flanagan was able to do this. And then also, you know, I know he doesn't direct every episode, but he's bringing in people that he's worked with on other shows. And it's, uh, it just seems like the the perfect marriage all around. So, and then Heather Langenkamp too. I mean, you can't, that's a, such a great, uh, a great team. Yeah. Yeah. And she's, she's really good. And of course, yeah, you'll see frequent Mike Flanagan uh, collaborators, uh, throughout he always it's it's always one big mike flanagan family um, which is awesome um and so yeah so i think uh, i think everybody will have fun with that and you were so so lucky of you to uh, get to watch it early too i'm, I'm not jealous at all i can see <laughs> <laughs> well it's only because some of us had to go to the movies to watch stuff that just came out <laughs> yeah it's only because i'll be do doing stuff at comic con so we will have oh, yeah. some coverage coming up Absolutely. Well, I'm and glad. Uh, and you're like, well, you I could have, I could have done that coverage. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. There's, there's enough, there's enough horror to go around right now with, with everything that's coming out. And speaking of, we will, uh, we'll, we'll give it back to you because you have, uh, you have 
feedback or review impressions of Hocus Pocus 2. Um, I heard from Disney that it was their most streamed movie, I guess, or their, uh, it, it seems like it, or maybe their most streamed anything. A lot of people watched it. That's what I heard. I'm not going to quote what they had. They had some advertisement for it. A lot of people saw it. And, um, and obviously the, the first movie has, um, it's, it's interesting how big the first movies become in that it's like, it's one of those like yearly watch things, almost like there's certain movies that people watch at Christmas every year. And of course, like with, with Halloween, but Halloween used to be more of a spread where like, you know, people would watch their like, uh, whether it's the shining or the exorcist, but I think there's like Hocus Pocus has hit this like cultural sweet spot depending on, on who you are, maybe you're, as a creator, like I don't want it to hit this sweet spot. Um, but where even if you haven't seen the movie, you're aware of its existence and the witches because you see it at Spirit Halloween and because it's, you know, there's plenty of memes and gifts and it just seems like 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 it's everywhere. So it was it was only a matter of time. If it wasn't going to be a sequel, it was going to be a reboot or remake. Um, but enough from me. Derek, you saw it. What do you think? Oh, wow. Yeah, this was years in the making. I went into this one with a lot of excitement, but also nervousness just because I have seen the original probably almost as many times as any other movie I've seen. Uh, it's right up there in the top three for sure, uh, just because of all those marathon, endless marathons on uh, Freeform, the artist formerly known as ABC Family. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, and we, we were lucky enough, um, we were able to, uh, me, my brother-in-law, my sister, uh, we got together with Zach and Sarah, who are the uh, hosts of Soup Fest. And for more on that, listen to our previous episode. Uh, but we got to get together because they're big Hocus Pocus fans. And we we got to watch the the second one uh, last night. And it was it was really fun. It was, I, I, I had a blast uh, for the most part, just, you know, going back into this world, uh, seeing the Sanderson sisters again, and, and kind of just embracing that spirit of Halloween, uh, and, and kind of the magic of Halloween. It's, it definitely, I think the highlight is definitely, uh, seeing Bette Midler, Sarah Jessica Parker, and Kathy Najimy coming back in those roles. It's like they never left those roles. They were, the chemistry was still there. The dialogue was perfect. And then he also had Doug Jones come back as the zombie Billy Butcherson. So that was a lot of fun to get to get some of the band back together there. And, you know, there's some really cool stuff. They explore the backstory of the Sanderson sisters. So you go back to Salem in the 1600s and see what they were like as kids, which I think is really cool just to see them as younger, ver see younger versions of those characters. And they also have some really good new characters. They have uh, a new trio of friends, uh, these three girls that are like in high school uh, that are kind of like going through some um, some troubled times in their friendship group. So they're kind of trying to navigate high school and and where where, you know, whether or not they'll still be friends. And they're trying to figure out kind of keep their sisterhood together. So there's a lot going on in the movie, but I think overall there's there's more than work more works than doesn't work. Do you have to have seen the first movie to fully enjoy the second? No, I I I mean to fully enjoy like maximum capacity. I Sorry, would say I, yes. I I'm gonna change my <laughs> to enjoy it within reason. <laughs> I, I I would say. Yeah, they made it very accessible. And I think that was probably the biggest goal for them, like for a new generation of viewers. I mean, not everyone watching this is like me where I've just been watching it on Endless Loop mm. for 30 years, you know. Oh, wait, like, you, and you have a Hocus Pocus shirt on. I do. Yes, I have the uh, yeah. the buy or die cavity colors uh, Sanderson sister shirt on right now. I thought it was rather appropriate. But, you know, there's... I. <laughs> It's it's one of those things where uh, it, it's a lot. Of, it's just a lot of fun. I mean, I was hoping to see more original characters from the from the first film, but I kind of understand why they didn't as well, just because I think the Sanderson sisters are 
kind of the the through line of the franchise. And so they're kind of the way that you can introduce new characters. And you also want to spend time with the new characters. So I, I get why they did that, even though I really wanted to see some other familiar faces. But there's a lot of great Easter eggs. They have a lot of fun with in, with introducing the Sanderson sisters to uh, modern times, like how they're freaked out by like the Siri device um, uh -huh. when, when they hear Siri for the first time. Or uh, in this one, uh, Kathy's character, instead of riding the vacuum cleaner like she did in the first one, she she rides uh, two Roombas, <laughs> <laughs> vacuum Roombas. That's funny. So, did I mean, there's they have a lot of fun with it. They They pay homage to the original a lot while also doing this new story. Um, so it's, it's a lot of fun. It, it, you know, part of it does feel like a Walgreens commercial because there is a lot a substantial amount of time spent in a Walgreens, but you know, they have fun with it. So it's, it, I think it's, it's definitely one of those where I'm, I, I think I will have fun watching it and just appreciate that we got it. And, you know, it's, uh, it's just fun to see these characters again. So they, they do some really cool stuff and the new characters are great too. The, all the actors that play these younger kids, I mean, they they get a lot of time to do some cool stuff. And there's kind of some interesting uh, things about witchcraft that they put in there as well that really uh, leaves the door open for some some cool stuff in the future, potentially. So I'm excited to see where they might go next. But it, this could also be the last chapter. I don't really know. Interesting. Yeah, it's um. I'm I'm happy that it, that it worked for you. I know this movie is like such a big part of so many people's lives. If you grew up at a certain time, like for my sister, uh, she was kind of the same way. She was showing it to her new son. She was excited for the original and excited for it to come out. Um, and uh, and yeah, so I'm I'm very happy for uh, for everyone that got a chance to check it out. Um, I've seen it I've seen it quite a bit. I'm, I'm not gonna I have seen it quite a bit. Saw it when I was younger. Um, I, I don't hold it that close to, to my heart, but it also I could have been an age thing. Um, and so at some point I will probably check it out. Yes. And I think, uh, you know, it's like you said, you don't need to necessarily have seen it, but I think there's a lot to appreciate if you, if you do love the first one as much as I do. And they, uh, they do some fun stuff with those Roombas too. There's, uh, there's some really great stuff going on there. So uh, something yeah. I did not expect you to to be, you know, saying that this movie leans on. <laughs> that, that's the great thing, though. It's actually like a, it may it ha, it plays an important part in the plot. Um, it's not just like a a throwaway joke for like, oh, remember she wrote a vacuum cleaner in the first one? Like it actually makes sense for some of the stuff that happens later on. So, so that's a lot of fun. Uh, but you know, it's uh. It's one of those things where you, you try not to compare it too much to the first one because it's like it's not even fair, you know, like just when you love it that much. But yeah. it, I think it it's it's fun and hopefully it'll introduce a whole new generation to, you know, Hocus Pocus. And that's really the the most important thing. There you go. Well, I, like I said, I'm happy for you because I know you I know how excited you were. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Brian. I know that you did some kind of immersive experience. Yes. I, I, and I, and I want to know much more. I, I'm, I'm excited. So, yeah, no, this is more just to tell you about it, Jonathan. Than exactly. That's why else. I'm yeah. like, yeah, it's just, it's just the two of us lean in. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, over the weekend, uh, I went to, uh, one of the local kind of small venues, Cafe Nordo, uh, had this immersive experience called the spirit parlor. Um, we weren't sure um, exactly what to expect from it because the people who put on the production, like previous stuff they did, did was more comedy based. So it was like they do like an annual, like a very diehard Christmas and they did some kind of like uh, funny take on Titanic, um, you know, as these kind of like little stage plays kinds of things. So we were thinking maybe it would be something like that where, you know, there was a lot of humor involved. Uh, what I got was actually surprising and it was very kind of dark and bittersweet and very immersive um it was because the the venue where they did this was maybe big enough for i think there were like half a dozen like maybe eight or nine tables like four top tables um and then enough uh area for them to put in like little 
uh it wasn't like a one stage thing it was something where like the uh the the performances were taking place kind of throughout the the venue um and so the premise was that you're taking part in like the spiritualist gathering uh where this kind of underground group gets together and calls upon the spirits and so they kind of introduce the 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 whole how the evening is going to work how they're going to you know split the veil between the living and the land of the dead and so when they do it just kind of incorporates these various spirits come out and they have like their little designated area. So there's this one spirit that was like a, um, a Russian uh, composer that you find out was, you know, killed for, for writing a subversive operetta. Um, there is a like circa world war one soldier that comes out and kind of is there telling his story and kind of reliving his experience. Uh, there's a botanist, um, who, uh, Jonathan actually, her story reminded me a lot of, uh, when we went to overlook and heard that story from, uh, pumpkin pie about like the, the witches that, got burned oh yeah for, yeah you know for for the the, the various from the services. remaking yeah. yeah um this was a very similar story it was like this woman who you know was kind of that person you go to when there's something that like regular medicine can't solve um but she also kind of had a you know a reputation for dabbling in the dark arts um so there were just a few different kinds of like spirits like that i think there were like five or six uh, and you had the opportunity of like getting up and interacting with them um there was this one, like one of the spirits was an oracle who would give you tasks to go out and do. Um, and so they played with a lot of different things in terms of like lighting, the the areas where the spirits were. You could interact with a lot of the stuff like you were allowed to like rifle through like any papers and books that they had. Um and the the actors uh, slash singers who were doing the performances were really good. Um, and in fact, one of them was doing. I forget what it's called, but it's kind of like that acrobatic work where there's like the silk strands that come down from the ceiling and like you get, get like wrapped up in it. Yeah. I'm and, familiar yeah. with it, but I, I do not know what it's yeah. called. Um, the, the woman doing that was phenomenal. Um, so yeah, it was a really good experience. Like we all, and they like had really good drinks and I don't drink, but they also did like really good mocktails. So like, I even got to feel fancy that night. No, um, wonderful. Yeah. It was, it was kind of a, it was a really nice surprise. Cause I didn't like, I don't think any of us knew exactly what we were getting going into it. And it wound up being something that was like really, really satisfying. That's great. I mean, I, I, I do love the immersive entertainment scene because you never know exactly what to expect and, and, and you never will, right? Because it's, it's in some cases, in a lot of cases, you know, these artists are, um, they have to make up for their budget and they have to do things in creative ways, but also they don't have 10,000 people to perform for. They don't have everything on this one big stage. So it's like, how do you tell these intimate stories? How do you do them in different ways? Um, how do you bring people in with uh, with things that they, they don't expect? And so whether it's um, at Overlook or in New York or, or in Seattle, I'm, I'm always uh, excited to hear what people have going on. Yeah, that sounds amazing. It's It sounds like uh, this kind of stuff, speaking of Overlook, like from past years that you would hear about with, you know, how you'd be in the middle of some performance or something you never know yeah. what's going to happen and you're just you're kind of there as a spectator but you're also like a part of it too and i just love that i, I really want to yeah i would love to do more of that I, I think that's such a great like 4d way of telling a story that i think uh any any chance to do something like that it sounds like uh something i would definitely want to do if i'm ever in uh seattle well, it looks like they've got playings going through, like it's a limited thing, but if you if you live in the Seattle area, uh, it's going through November, it looks like, and they've Ooh. still got tickets on sale. So uh, nice. check it out if you're interested. Uh, I think you can just go to, I think it's just uh, cafenordo.com slash spirit hyphen parlor. And I'm sure if you just Ooh. do like a Google search, Cafe Nordo, uh, N-O-R-D-O, I'm sure you can find it there too. Yeah, that's nice. really cool. Well, yeah, thanks for turning us on to it. And hopefully some people who are listening are in the area and we'll, we'll check it out. 
is it kind of like a like a speakeasy almost where you have to like just to get in there it's kind of an adventure like with a password or like going down a dark hallway or anything like that no there's nothing they don't have kind of like the faux like hidden aspect of it it's it's pretty well you know marked on where it is um but there's okay. definitely like a you know you get the tickets ahead of time so like you know someone's there to greet you and make sure you like you know you're uh you're, you're part of the group and things so there is kind of a a certain sense of formality about it which is cool but yeah there's not that like they're not trying to um hide it or anything like that gotcha okay so yeah it is like recognized that it is like a mm -hmm. you know it's it's an event yes yeah <laughs> well that's awesome yeah i am i am really excited to get back to more immersive experiences hopefully next year um i've wanted to return to sleep no more and we've talked about that in new york um, and there are, there are quite a few too, in, in LA, some of them are limited time. So if you miss them, you miss them. Um, and that's what makes them fun too, right? Not, nothing lasts forever. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited for that to return to full force, hopefully next, next year, fingers crossed. Mm. Yeah, that's, uh, it, it, you never know what it's, like I said, it's never, it's never quite the same and it, it's super, uh, you know, I think of like some of the coolest stuff that they used to do at like comic con when we'd go there or just different things where you're, or the stories you've told of overlook, like their, you know, old war stories of, you know, stuff that where things got really intense that they, you know, have had to, because of obviously with COVID and everything, have had to scale back on some of the immersiveness of it, but uh, we were still able to have a really good time with that this year though. Yeah. Yeah. It was fun. I can't wait to see what they come up with for next year. And so I am going to wrap things up by talking. I can see Brian's starting to get a little uneasy. I'm going to be talking about the new <laughs> Hellraiser. Um, and so it's, you know, if you're, if you're listening to this now, you might've seen it. You might've been like, I saw that already. Or if you're in Fantastic Fest, you're like, I already saw it. I, I, you spoil away. <laughs> um, but because so many people have not seen it, I will not spoil. I'll talk about it at a high level because I won't be here for next week's episode. And the plan for next week's episode will be for them to dive into Hellraiser in spoiler, spoiler free in as much detail as they want. And I wish I could be there, um, but I'm just going to give a high level. Well, I'm going to walk wow. away. Yeah. So, so Brian's going <laughs> to unplug and Brian, you can put just the take, take, on. take the, uh, take the earbuds <laughs> off or put it on which, mute. Which is weird because by the time anyone's hearing this, I'll probably have already seen it. But I know it's, it's a weird as of right now, I have not, thing. Yeah. So Brian's going to walk away. I'll give a thumbs up when, when we're ready. And I <laughs> promise good. I won't trick you. I promise. <laughs> but now that I said it, it's like, then why would yeah. he say it? <laughs> Just as I'm coming in, can't believe they got Andrew Robinson to come back. It was wild. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to wheel right. in How this cardboard know? cutout of Brian <laughs> in the meantime. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. Hi. So Derek, so now we can talk. Um, and maybe you're like, I don't want to know anything, but you're here. And so this is, this is what happens. Um, and so the short straw. <laughs> yeah. So, so listeners, um, what can I say about Hellraiser? Uh, it's one of my, the original is one of my favorite films. Many of you know that, uh, along with Brian's, he did the, you know, Hellraiser razor. And, uh, and so, you know how near and dear this movie is. And so what I will say is, I think kind of what you said, Derek, about how, you know, you were talking about Hocus Pocus and you're like, well, it can't, you know, reach the heights of the original, but I'm so happy that they made it. And it's something for new people who are going to, you know, see it and experience it for the first time. Like, that's my like short version of my thoughts on the new Hellraiser. Um, I really, 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 really like it. There's a lot of things that they do that are really cool. But it is it is also it's 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 not the original. It's they're they're going out to they they're setting out to do something different, and so I think that in many ways when when Clive Barker was doing and, and he and he said this basically directly himself when he was making the original he was setting out to make I think more of a mature film right he had more mature actors mm -hmm. um, it was definitely against the grain of what you saw with like your teen slashers at the time which helped make it stand out. Also following Julia for a majority of the movie made it feel different. And um, and so for this movie, I think, you know, to kind of set expectations for everyone, I think this movie does an incredible job of expanding on the mythology. 
But what I think that they do is, which is where I think the expectation setting piece is, is it has some of the like story elements of a more traditional, like young adult horror film. And so we do have a relatively young cast that we follow for a good bit of the movie. And there is a structure in place, at least for a good bit of the movie, that feels like uh, like a tr- like a, a modern horror film. And so what David Bruckner and, and team have done, though, is they smartly kind of took that setup that maybe younger audiences too, especially now are more used to, and they've completely wrapped it in like a, a Clive Barker inspired, um, you know, world. And so we get the, the, the mythology, as I mentioned, is expanded. We have a new version of the puzzle box and I won't say what it does. I won't say how it's new, but it's, it's, people are like, they're like, it's a new design. How does it work? And we were joking before about, or like, why are you doing this? We were joking on the, the Hellraiser razor about the fact that the original box like has like this metal moving thing when you're kind of moving around it and it's, Uh and it's wooden, but so it's like, so how can you move it around? I'm making all these extra hand gestures and stuff just because I know Brian's looking at me. (laughs) And so I could see him being like, what? Um, And so, I think what they did with the box is really, really cool. And I think some of the backstory they do is cool. It adds additional elements without, I think, demystifying everything. Mm-hmm. Speaking of de- yeah, and speaking of demystifying, I think one of the worry, you know, one of the problems with the Hellraiser franchise over time was that you would see like too much of the Cenobites. So we kind of get into like two, three, and four, and then after that, it was like Pinhead would kind of show up and kind of be shoehorned in. Um, I think <laughs> then you they, saw less of them. <laughs> yes, and I think they have the appropriate amount of Cenobite interactions here. They are really okay. scary. The special effects are excellent, and and Jamie Clayton, she kills it. As the new, you know, in a lot of cases, they're referring to her as the priest. Then uh, just like they never refer to Pinhead as Pinhead (laughs) in the movie. In the movies. Yeah. And (laughs) and she's incredible. Um, Yeah. I not once did I watch and I'm and I'm sorry for Hellraiser Pierce and I'm sorry Doug Bradley but I did not watch this movie once being like I miss Doug Bradley or Doug Bradley should have been here. Where is Doug Bradley? Because. It, and it's not, like I said, it's not just the makeup. The makeup's fantastic. It's the performance. It's the voice. It's everything. Like, she kills it. Like, I am super excited to see additional Hellraiser movies with these Cenobites. Um, and so, in short. Nice. I think that there are some people that, like, have fallen head over heels with this movie, and rightfully so. I think there are going to be some other people who are really big fans of, of Hellraiser. And you may be like, I was expecting this movie that was going to be like on par with, you know, with the original. And that really probably was never going to happen. And it, it doesn't happen here. This is one of my favorite films. It, to me, it doesn't surpass the first, but it, we've gotten so many crappy sequels over the years. Like it's significantly better. I almost liken it to almost like Prey, right? Like Predator fans were in for a huge treat when they got that one. Hellraiser fans are in for a huge treat uh, with the new one. So I am excited for everybody to experience it. That is awesome. Yeah. And, you know, Prey also being released through Hulu, uh, like Hellraiser is going to be. So it's really interesting that they're really delivering some some top-notch horror right now and yeah and i love prey so i'm excited to see hellraiser love everything that you're saying about it it makes me even more excited for it and you know even though hellraiser as a franchise isn't the most like near and dear to my heart just because i haven't seen it as much as you know like the halloweens and the friday the 13th and everything like that I'm super excited that they're it's it feels like it's a step in the right direction just from the people involved, having Clive Barker on board as producer and just Bruckner and that writing team and everything about it has felt like a step in the right direction, the whole way that they've been developing it. So I'm just super excited that for this franchise and for the diehard fans of the franchise that it's finally moving in this direction and that they not only have a new Hellraiser to look forward to, but one of this quality just is is such an exciting time for horror fans. And, you know, it makes me want to go back and, and you know, 
watch re rewatch uh, some of the early Hellraiser films too. So hopefully it'll like Hocus Pocus too, except maybe a, a an older, slightly older horror audience. It will make them go back and watch uh, the originals. So I at mean, least it's... one and two, at least one and yeah. two. And then if you're like, those are, those are great. I'll keep going. And then three and four. And then after that, it's up to you, <laughs> but uh, they lay some great groundwork too. I'm, I'm really hoping this is a first of multiple films, but Brian's sitting there, he's waiting, you know, and, uh, and so I'm moving the thing. And so then they do this and, ah, and then that, and I'm looking at Brian as he's like, no, <laughs> Anyway, Brian, you can come back. <laughs> I was moving come my hands like I was unlocking the box and, and he <laughs> he was like, what is he doing? Yeah. Did, did you guys have a signal ahead of time or are you just improving? No, we're just improving. <laughs> is it safe? Oh, it, it's safe. As long as Derek doesn't say anything, it's safe. I won't say, <laughs> I, I won't say anything. And, and I didn't spoil, I didn't spoil, I honestly didn't spoil anything, but Brian wants to know nothing going in. And I can appreciate that because I'm the same way. I did tell Brian before we started recording the episode, Derek, that sometimes because you'll start going into more spoiler territory and listeners, I have cut out a number of spoilers that Derek <laughs> has just, they'll just start talking. We'll be like, this is a no spoiler episode. And then he's be like, and then at the end, I really liked when they, I'm just like, so sometimes when you when you're talking, you can't see you couldn't see this before, but now that we're on video, sometimes I'll pull my earbud so I can hear you making noise, but I can't hear what you're saying. And then I know it's my time to jump in. <laughs> I think I think you do that on regular phone calls with me too. And that's funny. <laughs> sometimes. It all makes sense. It now. is. It does. <laughs> so with that, this episode has almost come to an end. I say almost because we have some things coming up that I wanted to call out. We um, have some New York Comic Con coverage, so keep an eye out for that. We still have, uh, we just uh, recently released our uh, Hellraiser interview. We have uh, tons of coverage out of Fantastic Fest that's worth your time. Make sure to check that out. Um, and on top of that, we have uh, for our podcast coming up, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll spoil some of this stuff. We have plans to talk Hellraiser in detail. I say we, but not me. We have plans to talk Halloween ends in detail. We, but not me. I won't, I won't be around, but I will be back soon. And, um, and we do have some other stuff, some fun stuff cooked up for, uh, for listeners. And, and we, we have a special episode coming up maybe sometime in November. We'll see um, if we can get it out in time for Halloween. We will, but no promises, but we are working on something special that we hope you will like. Um, and then, yeah, aside from that, um, yeah, I mean, we always have some kick-ass coverage, so make sure to head over to dailydead.com. Check out our backlog. We also want to thank Brian, our engineer, for helping us out each and every episode. So thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. And as always, we want to thank our listeners. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, especially those who've signed up for Corpse Club membership. You can visit corpseclub.com. You can check out all of our episodes. You can also sign up to become a member. It'll give you a membership card, a pin, a t-shirt. You can pick an episode topic. So make sure to go to corpseclub.com to check it out. Don't forget to rate and review us. We're on Apple Podcasts. Every rating and review really, really helps. If you want to get in touch, you can reach out anytime. We are at contact at corpseclub.com. We're on Twitter at Daily Dead News. We're at Corpse Club. And on Instagram and Facebook, we are under Corpse Club as well. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, stay scary. Thank you.